so first of all good evening and welcome to this webinar uh, titled atel to get synthesis which is a very important step in the vsi asic data design flow and even before we begin i hope you and family are doing well in this tough time and may god keep us in good health so with this i start the presentation and in this presentation all it's very tough actually to uh, cater all the synthesis aspects into one presentation in a very short duration of time i try to pick up very crisp and short topics and first of all try to explain uh, the evolution of how the gate uh, atel to gate synthesis come about a typical uh, atel to gate synthesis process flow and where the synthesis process actually fits in the full vsi design flow some of the integrated features that you will actually encounter if you work in the industry and if you are willing to work so how can we actually integrate the power optimization and dft insertion inside the synthesis flow and moving on we'll uh, just name a few uh, major synthesis tools uh, mainly cadences and snops are pretty much dominant in the industry uh, a case study uh, cadence case study where they actually displayed the power of one of their latest uh, technology and actually having a very good ppa all throughout the design and finally we'll conclude with the role and responsibility and the also obviously the job opportunities that you will find as a synthesis engineer if you are landing in the vilis industry okay uh, so with that let's start uh, so the term synthesis uh, actually is synonymous to a biological process called photosynthesis which we actually read in our in our elementary school so by definition is actually the process where the plants take the energy from sunlight and convert it into carbon dioxide and water into food so in the same way we can think the sunlight is actually the inputs for the synthesis which is our rtl i'll come to the details later but it's actually the input that we get the plant in this case can be our engine our synthesis engine the output of oxygen and the other chemical substances is basically our netlist and other file so this is where the you can find a similarity between a process which we have learned way back and what we are going to learn and at least get a glimpse today okay so uh, how to first of all how do you define logic synthesis and what is actually mean so we can actually defined as a pro automatic production of interconnected standard cell components in the form of a netlist so that's why it's called a netlist because you connect different components with nets from a synthesizable hdl which means heartable distribution language it can be very log hdl system very log doesn't matter into uh, taking into consideration the ppa and this is what the synthesis tool or any implementation actually targets it's actually the power performance and area as a cost function so in the definition itself you can actually find a lot of important terms with which the synthesis is actually related to so for example first step, first it has to be automatic uh nobody does a manual calculation nobody does a manual generation of a netlist interconnected standard cell so standard cell as i told you it's it's one of the sunlight for you it's, so it's one of the inputs of so the mandatory inputs that your library cell team or any other team will provide you it will be and maybe or basic gates as well as it can be complex gates also it may be a full adder also optimized very well in terms of the timing area and power from a synthesizable hdl so this is very important because uh, what do you mean by synthesizable hdl if an, if an rtl is not synthesizable then it cannot produce the desired output it cannot produce the desired netlist so the constructs in the rtl has to be written in such a way that the rtl is synthesizable and realizable in hardware okay something like a dollar time or there are a few syntaxes which are not allowed okay and what you'll be targeting is about power performance and area the order can vary depending on what you are actually targeting what is your gigahertz frequency that you are trying to achieve what are your area targets what are your power budgets and the tool will actually optimize them in what is known as a cost function so it's basically uh, the easiest way to visualize a cost function is uh, like ax plus by versus cz 
So A, B, C are your weights and X, Y, Z are your cost functions. So you make one of the weights higher, one of the weights lower, you'll get the perfect cost function to achieve balance. The final output, as I told you, will be a netless. So in this way, in very simplistic terms, you can actually define the logic synthesis. Okay. So uh, how does, how is, or how has the RTL synthesis has been evolved? How has the tool evolved, the algorithm evolved? And actually it has taken a lot of decades, but even before that, you have to understand that any physical design, physical implementation, whether it's synthesis, backend, PIN, or any particular implementation flow has actually matured, or any ASIC design has actually matured because of which, uh, because of the targets that the industry is actually facing. So I'd like to show you a few slides with respect to which the tools are actually mature or the tools are actually trying at the level best to get their performance. Okay. So uh, the two graphs that I shown, shown out here is actually from uh, the IRDS. The IRDS is, uh, stands for International Roadmap of Devices and Systems. And actually what, it, uh, what uh, the body does is actually projects the problems in Willis I that we will face as a near term challenge, which means it's an immediate thing that we need to solve or as a long term challenge. And you can see on the left hand side, on the left hand side graph that the issue of a power density is, 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 is a near term challenge. It's a near term challenge because our frequencies are going on the upper side. So it's, it will always increase. We want to get the maximum frequency out of a CPU or out of a design. But what the problem is that if you're increasing the frequency, if you're in the frequency and um, what really happens is the power dissipation is going higher. If this leakage or dynamic, we'll look at it, but it's going higher. And this is a problem. So that's why even though we are able to, uh, if we need to maintain at a very constant power density, which means you can say roughly a multiplication between your frequency and your power, our scaling factor will, will go down. Okay. On the similar side, we can see on the right hand side another graph. Here, ISO frequency means at the same frequency. That if on today, if on today in 2020, we have a we have a scaling of one, which means okay, we start at level zero. The problem we, we face uh, in the coming years is it will never be one. The desire is always being one, the scaling factor. But the issue is it will always go down. You have to just spend, you cannot for the same meeting the same frequency, uh, for meeting the, the, the same frequency, you have to have a similar power budget. Okay. So this is actually termed as a near term challenge uh, from the IDS side. Okay. Same, another challenge is, uh, as we know, our SOCs these, these days have a lot of cores in build and this will go up. You have CPU, you have GPU cores, you have multiple CPU cores uh, in built on SOC. And that is, uh, that is another problem uh, because in this respect, you have multiple blocks talking to each other. How will your performance be impacted in terms of implementation? How well we can do implementation in those cases? Our areas are getting large. How, and how can we optimize the area? Our interconnects are becoming a problem. We'll come to that. So how we can optimize into that? And that is another problem that is being uh, told by IRTS. Another interesting thing is that you all know, you've all read uh, in, in your courses that we are trying to actually uh, minimize our feature size, which means that you're going from 20 nanometer to 16 to 14 as, as the device shrinks, so you're shrinking the gate length size you're moving into CMOS to FinFX, but what is the hit? When you actually decrease the wire length, you decrease the wire area, your resistance goes high. You all know, right? It's, it's a resistance is to L by A. So you reduce the area, your resistance goes high. What is the penalty? Your penalty is the time delay, right? Because we all know that your charging times will be higher if your resistance is higher. And there it comes, there comes a bottleneck where your on, your transistor gate delay is reducing, but somehow you're you're not we are not really able to scale the wide as much. So again, for the implementation of the synthesis tool, 
the optimization in terms of wire has also should be actually taking care right so with another uh, issue similar to the last is uh, the concept of what we call as an interconnect and typically when you have multiple cores multiple blocks you have uh, let's say this is an example of a uh, of an soc which has a modem which has a cpu which have two cpus it has audio units it has different units as well as the ios the periphery the peripheral right now these components have to talk to each other which means that data has to be communicated between each other and how to do that typically it it is it is known as a network on chip in industry and this is also a bit uh, complicated because uh, here you also need to understand how the optimization will go in the interconnects right so keeping in mind whatever we talked about about the wire del wire delay issues uh, the interconnect issues the area issues if you if you are actually punching multiple cores into a single soc or even um, um uh, the different uh, power densities that that we saw right so these were actually the driving forces between uh, beyond uh, these were the, actually the driving forces behind the development of the commercial tools that you will get in the industry today so i i really don't want to bore you with um, all this history but uh, just a quick fact that this synthesis has been logic synthesis as we call it has been for decades so it, it start, started with uh, somewhere around 50s and some of the algorithms you already have learned in your courses like the kmac or, or the uh, quinn nikolsky algorithms and one interesting fact i want to mention is uh, there was a paper in 1986 called socrates one of the co-authors actually uh, is actually the ceo of uh, synopsis right now so pretty interesting and uh, this is actually not the full history there are a lot of going on but i'll come to the what are the latest tools offering also okay so with that uh, understanding of the challenges now we need to understand we need to take a leap of faith from the logical synthesis and what we know today today what is used in the industry known as a physical synthesis so what is the challenge so i explained that okay the rtl the constraint design power performance area targets but if we go to the back end cycle right there's a lot of other physical information that actually is taken as an input to the backend tool it can be in terms of the wide lays wire informations or the physical location of the blocks where it's sitting power grid information the power supply information so when you actually go from the synthesis to the layout the final layout right in terms of the ppa which i mentioned you can see a vast miscorrelation today earlier the issue was not that can say uh, blown out proportion but today it's a very serious issue so that's why tool started to look at how can we make a better correlation between the layout and your synthesis and that's how the our physical synthesis emerged so one was logical so right now what is following in industry is pretty much a physical aware flows what is called a physical aware synthesis so right now go to a typical process and i'll actually mention how the physical process fits in or where actually the synthesis really fits in okay so uh, what you see is a typical asic design flow and starting from where you lay down your design specs develop rtl and all the way down to packaging and fabrication so uh, as you can see synthesis steps uh, synthesis sits uh, as a bridge you can say between rtl and place and route so where so hence it's uh, not only synthesis important but uh, you can say the there are some aspects of it like post synthesis post synthesis checks like formal verification and other netlist checks are also important as well as the synthesis itself okay so if we move from the design specifications to the packaging and testing or chip fabrication synthesis is kind of a bridging all these area so that's why i call it it's, it's a best of the front end as well as back end so back end typically starts from the flow planning until the till the sign off and front end so some school of thought considers synthesis as a part of the front end some school of thought consider it as part of the back end but right now things have gone more into the back end side 
as I explained, and the reasons behind it also. Okay. So if we deconstruct the synthesis steps, uh, and we try to see what are the inputs and the outputs. Okay. So the blue ones are the basic inputs. I can say a mandatory inputs. For example, as I mentioned, standard cells, synthesizable RTL, design constraints. So typically what we have uh, as an input to the synthesis, it's called design constraint in terms of clock frequencies, IODLAs, exceptions. There are multiple, there are a lot in terms of the design constraints, the timing related constraints, as well as you can have power and area level constraints also. Okay, so the blue ones you can take as more or less a very, very much basic requirement. Optimization strategies, optimization preservation strategies. Uh, some, uh, some people only speak about optimization, but preservation is also very much important when you're actually working live on any project or on any industry or in team. Okay, so optimization can be various kinds of optimization. It can be a boundary optimization, an ungrouping. I don't want to bother you with the terms, but there are some steps that as a synthesis engineer, you need to understand which optimization techniques are the best for your design. Okay. Um, the orange ones are actually, you can say the physical level information that I was talking about. So floor pan information can also be fed to the physical level synthesis flow. Okay. Interconnect bill information in terms of a particular formats. If you talk about cadence, it's capital. If you talk about synopsis, it's a TLU plus. The routing information is, is, is also uh, very important nowadays, uh, as I mentioned, because of the wide delay issue, that what kind of layers are you using? What kind of layers, metal layers are actually allowed for you? Okay. And the final output, that's when it's green, it, it, it's, it's actually one which is most required. There are other files also required. But this is the basic desirable of any synthesis flow. It's a gate level netlist. Okay. Right. So it's a so where this netlist goes into your backend flow for the PNR and the other steps. So in this way, we can get a roughly a picture of what are the inputs, what kind of uh, extra inputs that you need to give to have your best synthesis possible and the corresponding output. So here I move on to the next. Uh, the next level of understanding of synthesis uh, because synthesis doesn't only mean getting on netlist because synthesis also means in terms of power how can i save power what are the ways of saving power in the synthesis right and also dft which i'll come later so first let's concentrate on the power optimization part so uh, this part I, I think you already know that the power components you can vastly divide into three categories one is switching power one is short circuit power and one is leakage power. Okay. So first of all, what is switching power? The switching power is actually the charging and this because of the, it comes because of the charging and discharging of the capacitor driven by the circuit. So in, in a CMOS, you charge and discharge the output cap, right? So it's of CVD square that you have learned. Correct. The short circuit power is actually, um, in, in a lot of times is actually short circuit power is taken as a part of this part of the switching power, but I'll, for the sake of clarity, I'll just keep it separate. The short circuit power is actually is actually the power dissipated by your gate when your when when there is when there is a short between the VDD and the VSS. And we can just imagine that uh, there will come a time there will come a time if you have radio CMOS filler side, then there will come a time where your both PMOS and MOS are typically in a CMOS. Okay. So this is where the short circuit power is actually being dissipated. Um, the next comes the leakage power. Again, it's, it's very important because uh, um, uh, nowadays uh, sub threshold leakage is very dominating. So the leakage power that flows in the circuit is uh, due to any part of the circuit being on. So your circuit might not be switching, but still if you have any terminal, if there's a voltage difference between any terminal, of your gate, you still have the leakage power. Okay. So with this understanding, I move on to optimization technique. So, um, as I mentioned, that you can broadly classify into static and dynamic power. Okay. So first, I'll come to the static power. Right. So the static power, what we need to do for uh, reducing the static power, uh, static power, 
so one way is to actually gate the clock because if we if our sequential element are not toggling then your gates are never on and then we can actually reduce the power okay clock gating is actually one of the most you can say a very important and critical topic not only for power but also for timing as well okay the next uh, you can say maybe multivity design you can have multi threshold voltage libraries multivity libraries in your supported by the foundry supported by the pdk from which you are taking the libraries sizing of the gate if you size the gate in terms of drives it can also help you so the synthesis tool looks at these optimization techniques when you are actually doing the static power optimization or maybe leakage power optimization as a whole okay so uh, what is dynamic power so again uh, clock gating comes both in dynamic uh, as well as static clock gating reduces the toggling activity when you don't need to toggle any sequential element again there are multiple steps uh, multiple parts where you can actually have activity based optimization pin swapping these are some of the algorithms that very some of the well known algorithms that synthesis tool follow since uh, we are talking about merging the merging the physical aspects like the physical synthesis there are tools also have capability of doing low power post placement those who don't know post placement it's perfectly fine you can just take in consideration it's a step where you can actually have a more prediction to the placement which is a back end flow and optimize with respect to power okay multiple registers is uh, another technique okay where you can actually club multiple shift registers into single registers supported by your technology directory okay another part another very important uh, part when you go to the architecture level optimization okay because what we are talking about is some of the parts static and dynamic we talk more about the cell level optimization the tool but a lot can come depending on your soc design or depending on your chip design how you are actually defining the power domains is is your does your chip support multiple voltage ranges does your chip support something known as uh, the dynamic voltage and frequency scaling or adaptive frequency scaling these also information is the intent of the architect the intent of the power architect how do you feed into the into the tool is also important and typically that is done by something as known as uh, power formats so you give information how do you want to save power with respect to architecture level specification and you insert or change the structure or insert these level shifters or power gating cells on those parts governed by your architecture okay so this is a very crude way of explaining what could be the possible techniques although there are numerous trust me so um, how do enable the low power design intent into synthesis so we have already seen how we disintegrate a single synthesis step and power intent in terms of what i mentioned power format in terms of cpu and upf actually it is taken as an input to synthesis okay along with maybe some other power optimization strategies for the dynamic and static what i mentioned okay so with this i go to another topic uh, which some of the which some of the companies actually follow is to do dft insertion inside uh, the synthesis a lot of companies do outside a lot of companies do inside a lot of companies have custom scripts custom flows to do inside synthesis so it depends on the company so but first of all uh, what is a dft so design for testing or design for testability consists of techniques that add extra hardware to your design so that faults or defects can be tested after fabrication so as you can see the dft is all about how can i test the design when my chip comes comes back from the fab how much i can detect and obviously these structures will be a part of your netlist so netlist if you had not done the dft and you are doing dft are going to be different is going to be testable friendly but it might not be timing friendly and this is a big fight always okay uh, some of the possible design techniques if if you can just uh, you can uh, 
search it in the internet for more details that what you can actually do the basic is actually scan stitching is actually connecting the scan chains some of the other techniques you can have in this inside synthesis it's called it's memory based uh, built in self test logic built in self test boundary scan on chip controllers test point insertion so these are you can say some of the techniques that the tool supports but again depending on where you are which team you are which uh, design you are working on what is your methodology team says or what do you follow what inside team follow it also it totally depends uh, on them that which architecture they take which part of the dft they take do they take dft at all or not okay and in the same way that we integrated the power the dft is specifications also go as an input let's say for example what could be the scan chain length what could be your scan clocks what be your resets okay so dft also goes in as a part of the input okay so uh, moving on some of the softwares that you will encounter in the industry typical softwares mainly dominated you can say by synopsis and uh, cadence it's, it's the design compiler nxt or uh, genus solution for the mentor it's oasis rtl so i've seen uh, a lot of companies a lot of teams where multi use multiple tools maybe for the same design just to get which tool works on which design best a lot of companies do that even in the back end tool they may run the same experiment but again um, the concepts don't change when you can move to synopsis to cadence or cadence to synopsis if you are a synthesis engineer and you know that what questions to ask correctly to which team what are the inputs that you should have at your plate what is the expected qr that the back end team is looking at then trust me these are uh, tools their power depends but in any case uh, you will find that it's easier to migrate one tool from the other if you have the basic knowledge of the concepts ready in your place okay so we'll look at just one case study um uh, because uh, um case study is also important in reading the paper so if you go to synopsis has a conference called snug every year cadence has uh, it's on cdn live conference where they actually publish papers so in these papers the users the companies the representatives actually showcase on their own designs what benefit they have actually got from their tools okay so this is just one example of a white paper and it's titled best full flow ppa by cadence and what it says is they have actually integrated the i special flow into the synthesis and they have got a better result in terms of people all throughout whether it's it's like the if max the frequency in terms of the run time or in terms of the leakage so they have got a better qr in every aspect so here what they show finally is that okay if i integrate a placement course in placement engine into my synthesis like i move from my back end encounter to my front end my synthesis tool i'll get a better ppa and this is what initially i try to explain that if i can estimate my y del is better if i can estimate a better correlation in terms of the congestion also in terms of the area also in terms of the power then i will always get a better ppa i will always get a better qr okay uh now this is now uh we need to understand what the role of synthesis engineer will is is because i see a lot of different companies the synthesis engineer works actually uh, for different roles for different responsibilities but i'll try to actually club a lot of them because it requires some skill set as well so we'll just look at that so i'll just uh, try to post based on my experience uh, what i've seen so what is the demand from a synthesis engineer so you will need to understand what kind of flow are you using and by flow some of you may know some of you may not know the digital design goes into inputs your scripts and your outputs 
this is the way any digital design flow works. So your flow setup, you have to you have to understand as a synthesis engineer that which PVT I'm working on, process voltage and temperature. Okay, should I do a synthesis on the typical process or on the slow process? What voltage stack should I pick up? Which libraries should I pick? Libraries means your standard cell libraries. They can be some memory, hard macro libraries also. Which one I should pick up? What PVT should they have? Which mode of the library? So there's a lot of going on in terms of the setup also. Okay. Next comes a very important and primary aspect is actually managing the constraints or developing or even handling the constraints. Okay. Because constraints here, I mean, typically it's actually done in SDC formats, so design constraints or tickle constraints, where I've, some of the part I mentioned in terms of creating clock, um, writing exceptions, your uh, case. So there can be many, many case analysis, uh, many, many constraints. Sorry, there can be many, many constraints depending on the design. So as a synthesis engineer, you need to understand that what kind of constraints I should develop. What do my constraints really mean at this stage and at the back end stage? What could be my margins or budgeting that I should have? Typically, budgeting in terms of uncertainty or in terms of input output budgeting, as we call it, that needs to be done. So your constraint has to be strong. This is what I what what, what I've seen a lot of uh, people lacking is a good constraint understanding. Okay. Another important aspect, what I wanted to talk about is actually the skill of automation. A, a, a lot of candidates miss that because maybe they're habituated just to run the flow. It, it is quite possible, no blame to them. But in time, you have to develop scripting language power in terms of Tickle and, tickle and Pearl because uh, the tools which I've, I've been talking about, they mainly work on Tickle Shell. Okay, they may, they may have their own commands, but you really have to have a good, uh, somewhat good uh, scripting knowledge. Okay, because these scripting knowledge will save you uh, in crunch time, trust me. Uh, another, another point what I mentioned is asking the right questions to the RTL, DFT and the power building teams because you need to understand what your block is actually targeting. I've seen uh, some blocks being targeted for power on or some blocks being targeted for high data path means you're using actually a very uh, complex gates in your data path which are optimized for special timing purpose let's say can you use a carry save adder can it, it be the fastest okay or a ripple carrier so you need to ask the right questions to the right team in order to get the correct input so that your netlist is is, a, is is of a good quality okay so this is very important time and time again you have to need to give the feedback also feedbacks are also very important in terms of this engine engineer rtl feedbacks does the rtl have any problem do you think the rtl can be of better quality so that you can meet the time so this is also most important also mentioned that uh, correcting strategies for optimization some of the strategies that i mentioned but Again, uh, optimization as well as preservation. What exactly you should optimize for? Are you looking for some part of the congestion also? Some part of the power also? So the correct strategies have also like to be decided by the synthesis engineer. And he or she should know what is going inside the flow which he's working on. Okay. Another thing that uh, a lot of... Uh, Synthesizers do time to time is but trials. They do a lot of trials in terms of optimization steps, in terms of uh, the PPA, what changes for the variables that I can do so that I can achieve the best QR result. Okay. And after that, you have done your synthesis very well. What comes next is uh, two important very steps, which is called formal verification, which is actually the verification step from RTL to synthesized netlist. So you have synthesized netlist, but but what guarantees that functionally they are same? Because it's a tool, it's doing some mathematical some mathematical algorithms it's applying and getting out a netlist. 
So the formal verification actually verifies that. It's it's a totally a separate topic. Uh, it's it's a vast topic. There are multiple strategies even for that. Hierarchical. Some people run hierarchical. Some run flat. Even the different tools have different methodologies. Okay. So as a synthesis engineer, you should know what is formal verification and even maybe to some part how to debug and identify the problems. Okay. Some of the post netlist checks and by post synthesis netlist checks, it, it's a very it can be a vague term because different companies have different ways of verifying. Okay, so it can be maybe um, maybe a floating input can be one of the classic examples. You're not allowed to have floating input in the netlist, right? So this is one example, and different companies have different. You can say uh, different strategies or different flows or different checklist for these uh, netlist checks. Okay, so this is a very crisp idea of what you can actually expect as a synthesis engineer and what could be your roles. Uh, now coming back to the most important part, maybe for a lot of you is actually the job opportunities. Now, if I go to the job opportunities part, the way I like to see it and the way I've seen across the industry is uh, typically you can actually be classified where you're landing up, if you're landing up in a particular team or any particular company is uh, either in EDA or the CAD or in pure implementation. Okay, so if you're in EDA, different companies also have different positions or demarcation in terms of um, whether you're an A or a product engineer or in R&D means somebody who can be a coder also. Okay, so in, in EDA, it's a very much different domain. The A's are the ones who actually support the tool to the customer. Okay, if you're in CAD, uh, by CAD I mean a design team CAD or a design company CAD, they do have, they also have a requirement in terms of synthesis engineer where the synthesis engineer needs to develop the flow, what I mentioned, maybe the PVTs, libraries, what inputs I need to take. Okay, and it can be a developer as well as a support guy. This is a very rough picture. And if you're into pure implementation, then it's all what I shown you in the last slide that as an implementation engineer, what are the things that you need to do? What are the things that are taken care of? Okay. Design companies typically hire for CAD and implementation. Whereas if you see um, EDA companies like Cadence, Synopsys and Mentor Graphics, they will mainly hire for, hire for these A's and, and B's. Okay. 